are we doing, everybody? And welcome in to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. We're here on a fantastic Wednesday here in the great state of Wisconsin or wherever you are tuning in today. I mean, we got stuff to talk about today, but some of it might be good. Some of it might be bad, right? I mean, we're watching the Brewers right now. They are down 7-1 to to the Dodgers. Just, I mean a disastrous inning for Colin Ray and the Brewers, and it's been downhill sledding ever since then. So I want to get into a little bit more Brewers today. We got some Packer talk to get to, lots to get to. So let's jump into it right away. The Vikings, they're going to be without J.J. McCarthy for a little bit here. By the looks of it, J.J. McCarthy went down with an injury there. It was kind of reported non... I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't in practice. It wasn't like it was the Vikings' fault that any of this happened there. But J.J. is expected to undergo knee surgery that will determine how much time he will be sidelined. So waiting to see what happens over this. Uh, McCarthy complained about knee soreness over the weekend and underwent an MRI on Monday night, which now has been reported to be a little bit worse than what we thought. And now we're going to see him undergo knee surgery there. So Vikings, you know, they were having this a little bit of a quarterback battle, I guess you could say, between Sam Darnold and J.J. McCarthy to see who would be the number one come week one. And if J.J. McCarthy, if he was not the number one week one, if he could potentially at some point in the season end up as the number one for the Vikings there, well, this kind of derails that for now. This is going to derail this for now. Like I said, it's going to depend on, I mean, how severe it is and how surgery goes, right, and what the timetable is going to look like after that to determine how long we're going to see Sam Darnold as the sole sole man there running the show and if J.J. McCarthy will play this season for the Vikings or if they're just going to basically tell him to rest it and we'll see you next season. You know, it's a sucky, sucky, uh, sucky time for the Vikings, right? It seems like anything that can go wrong, anything that can go wrong, it seems like it happens to the Vikings, right? If it's not their own doing, it's it's just nature. I, I don't know. It's something in the water in Minnesota. Well, it might. It, it definitely could be something in the water in Minnesota, right? I've seen some of the drivers that they have coming out of there, some bad drivers, right? Maybe it is something in the water over there that makes it just a little bit worse. I don't know, but man, oh man. I mean, J.J. McCarthy goes down. They've had, they've had injuries. They've had, I mean, just a mess of a time so far this offseason. So far this offseason, and this just adds to the pile. This adds to the pile. A lot of people were high on the Vikings. They were high on the Vikings potentially being like a 9-8, and 10-7 and 7 team, ending up finding their way into the postseason. And, well, I, I don't know if this completely derails that, if Sam Darnold can have a productive year, but it definitely puts a damper in the moods. It definitely puts a damper in the mood out there in Minnesota. So that was some of the NFL news that's been going on right now. Looking at a little bit more about the Packers here. And Matt LaFleur came out and talking about, you know, this upcoming game they're going to have against Denver and stuff like that. He said that he expects to play Lucas Van Ness against Denver while others will sit. Only a select few starters are actually going to play in that game. I don't know. Maybe we'll see like Jordan Morgan get in there, right? Maybe we'll see Cooper and Hooper or Hopper when they get back. You know, maybe if they're healthy, ready to go, maybe we see them enter into the starting lineups and just get some reps. He's going to use, as Matt LaFleur said, he's going to use Friday's joint practice to get reps, which, I mean, reps are reps. You're not playing against your own defense then. I mean, I could see it. I could see it from where he's going. It's a little bit more of a controlled environment when you're doing it in a joint practice. Now, if you ask some other teams like, the New York Giants, probably not as much of a controlled atmosphere as what I'm talking about, but I, I think it's a good a good plan for that. Van Ness simply, he wants to see Lucas Van Ness get some more time. You know, he had that short career at Iowa, comes into the league, doesn't play a boatload right away. He wants him to get the in-game reps. He wants him to get into the speed of things and 
start to build, start to get some more experience there, even though it's preseason, start to get a little bit more experience there because then once regular season rolls around, hoping to have him fueled, ready to rock and roll, and with a lot more game experience, basically, is what Matt LaFleur is shooting for there. So expect to see Lucas Van Ness out there and a select few starters. Outside of that, not expecting to see many others out there like Jordan Love. We will not see Jordan Love. We're not going to see Josh Jacobs. We're not going to see probably the starting wide receivers, I would assume. You know, Watson won't be out there. Dobbs, Wicks, uh, don't expect those guys. Jaden Reed, don't expect him. I would say Musgrave and maybe Kraft. Kraft might play in the preseason game against the Broncos, but I don't expect Musgrave to be out there. Defensive-wise, I mean, Jair didn't play last week if he's back. I wouldn't expect Jair, probably not. Uh, Valentine, maybe if he's back, but he's not back yet. Right. So I would not expect to see Valentine out there. I would say it would be the, some of the younger starters that are younger guys that were maybe out last week, like Jordan Morgan there, probably see him Cooper, probably see him Hopper. Like I was saying, probably see him out there a little bit, maybe for a drive, maybe for two, right. Get him into the flow of things. Kickers. We're going to see the kickers. We're going to see the starting kick. Well, whoever's going to be the starter, right. We talked about yesterday, Anders Carlson or uh, Greg Joseph. Who's going to be the guy? We don't know yet. The kicking battle goes on. So we'll see how that all works there. I mean, still going to be a good game. I, I'm still excited to see some of these second stringers, some of the guys who are going to fill the back ends of like the defense there. I'm excited to see some of those guys out there. So still going to be still going to be all the way around a, a game to watch. You still want to be able to watch this thing because you're going to see a bunch of the youth out there yet for Green Bay. And plus, maybe we'll see some more magic out of Lucas Van Ness there on the defensive line. <clears throat> so I, I've been getting some comments as of late, and it's coming from Bears fans. It's coming from Bears fans. So Bears fans, they try to find ways to irritate us, to drive us up a wall, and... I don't know if this one really drove me up a wall, but Bears fans are trying to point out to me why the Packers will stink this year because they stunk in all these categories last year, and they believe that it's just a never-ending trend for Green Bay that they're going to stink in these categories. So, number one, the big one, the run game was amongst the worst in the NFL. Yeah. Aaron Jones was out for, what, six games, eight games last season? Aaron Jones was out for a while. And never truthfully got healthy last season for Green Bay. Maybe down the stretch, maybe postseason when it rolled around there, then he was finally back to normal. Outside of that, he wasn't ready to go at all. You had A.J. Dillon running the number one back. Emmanuel Wilson didn't do much for him. They tried other options. Nothing was really working. A.J. Dillon was about all they had. Well, not working out too hot, right? Not working out too hot. So... Yeah, the the run game wasn't the greatest last year. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Because then they say, well, you know, they always just want to bring up passing yards. Pass- well, first off, you have a good uh, good amount of passing yards. That's cool. That's cool, right? I mean, if you get you get Jordan Love throwing for over, I mean, if he's throwing for a ridiculous amount of yards, the run game just has to be average, right? The run game just has to be average. But, but you just added Josh Jacobs into the room. Now, I don't know if a lot of people know a lot about Josh Jacobs simply because he play, played for the Raiders who were in all, they stunk, right? They were bad. That was a bad team, bad ran team all the way around. Bad everything going on out there. Josh Jacobs still put up a decent amount of yards. Now you bring Josh Jacobs into the fold in Green Bay with a good offensive line. <clears throat> I mean, yes. The Lions have Gibbs. The Lions have Montgomery. Swift is now with the Bears, right? So everything is good with the world, again, with those two teams. Don't sleep on Josh Jacobs. That's all I'm going to say. I am not going to take away from what, you know, Gibbs and Montgomery can. I saw Gibbs. I I thought I saw Gibbs. um, He was injured. I thought I saw. Uh, Let's see. He has suffered a hamstring injury. The concern meter. Here we go. The concern meter for Jameer Gibbs now. Let's see what they have as the concern meter. I I don't know what that even means. They don't have a... Um, He heard it at practice. Hamstring injury at practice. From all we know. Let's see if we can find some tweets on it there. 
they're not really sure how how long it's going to keep them sidelined at the moment there. But hamstring injuries, those are nagging injuries. Just ask our friend Christian Watson how that all works out for him. So this hamstring injury, if not treated properly and if not rested properly, could become a worse problem for Gibbs. So the Lions lose Gibbs. They still have Montgomery. So I'm not going to say, you know, their depth chart, they have Montgomery, then Gibbs, then Reynolds, who wasn't bad, and then Vakey back there. But, you know, Montgomery's still a good back. So the Lions will still have a good backfield. They're still going to have a good back in there. So will the Bears have DeAndre Swift. I've never thought that DeAndre Swift wasn't a good back. He's a solid back. So you have Swift in, with Chicago. You have Montgomery with the Lions there. And you have Aaron Jones now with the Vikings. How can I forget about that? Aaron Jones with the Vikings now. So you have, I mean, good backs in the NFC North now. Don't sleep on Josh Jacobs being a good back in the in the NFC North. Simply because you give him an offensive line. Now, this is a guy, I was just going to do that. I was just going to look up his career numbers there. I know they were a little bit down as of last, I, I believe it was last season he had a little bit more of a down year. Oh, that, well. You try to search up Josh Jacobs, and for some reason it shows up with Jacob Jacobs, who is a theater director. I have no idea who that is. I, I Maybe out there you guys know who Jacob Jacobs is. I have no idea who Jacob Jacobs is. That picture was in black and white, so I'm going to take a shot in the dark. That tells me he is not a theater director as of late. But, I mean, looking at Josh Jacobs over the years, in 2019 he rushed for over 1,000 yards. 2020, over 1,000 yards. 2021, he played in 15 games. He had 872 yards. Looking at the 2022 season, he had over 1,600 yards. Last season there in 13 games, he had 800 yards. 3.5 on his average there. But you look at the years. Let's look at the years here for Las Vegas. In 2022, I mean, you look at the Raiders over the years. Not solid. Not a solid team whatsoever. And Josh Jacobs still putting up good numbers there. The, I mean, his longs, 86 for a long there in 2022. Uh, looking at 2019, 51, this is still a dynamic back. And then you look at him out of the backfield there. In 2023, he had 296 yards out of the backfield. In 2022, he had 400 yards. So this is a guy who can get out of the backfield and still do damage for you while also doing it between the tackles, you know. And to me, I think the Packers' run game, I like Darren Jones. Don't get me wrong. I like Aaron Jones. I will tell everybody that I liked Aaron Jones. I actually did not like when the Packers originally, you know, kind of shafted him. Kind of shafted him out of a spot there. Or, well, not out of a spot, but out of a contract and out of bringing him back, right? So, I, I to me, I did not I did not like that move by Green Bay. I liked Aaron Jones. I thought he was a great back. I did. I thought if he could stay healthy, I thought it made it even better. I don't think that they got worse with the addition of Josh Jacobs. I don't think they got worse. Do I think that they got tremendously better? I liked Aaron Jones. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought Aaron Jones was uh, his own kind of dynamic back. I really did. So I am not going to sit here and tell you that I think that they got tremendously better by getting, you know, you look at Aaron Jones, 2022, over 1,000 yards, 2020, over 1,000 yards, 2019, over 1,000 yards. 2021, he had 799, and last season he had 656, but that was in 11 games there. I mean, all the way around, Aaron Jones has put up good numbers for Green Bay while splitting time, too. So, to, for me, I, I think the Packers, if they didn't go side to side, they might have got a little bit better just because of the age, right? Josh Jacobs is a little bit younger. Uh, looking at him, Aaron Jones is 29. I believe Josh Jacobs is a little bit younger there. He is only 26. I mean, put that into perspective. They got three years younger with Josh Jacobs and just about the same production there. Outside of Josh Jacobs is a little bit more of that bruiser guy. I mean, 5'10", 223. Aaron Jones is 5'9", 208. Josh Jacobs is just a little bit more of a bruiser guy for you. But Aaron Jones is a good side-to-side guy, and he was a good guy hitting the hole hard. I mean, that's what Josh Jacobs does too. So I'm I'm here saying Packers run game this next season, they're going to be solid. They're going to be solid. The next comment, the defense was awful. Okay, the defense was awful. I don't think it was awful completely all the way through. I thought Barry did not help the defense. 
I thought Barry actually, him calling the plays actually made it worse. When Matt LaFleur started calling the defense down the stretch, I thought the defense got better, right? So that's where I stand on the defense of the Green Bay Packers. I think with Halfley now in the room, I think with the additions of Bullard, and I think with Valentine, Van Ness, uh, Cooper, you know, some of these guys, hang up, um, trying to think of some Rashawn Gary have another year, Devontae Wyatt, Kenny Clark, you know, Jair staying healthy, uh, adding Xavier McKinney, Quay Walker with another year of experience. All the way around, I think the defense has improved. I think they got some youth in there now. I think they have some ball hawks in there. And I think with Halfley running the defense, a new 4 3 style defense, I, I'm loving what I've seen at Green Bay's defense so far. I think there's a lot of drive behind this defense. I think this defense is going to be very, they're very underrated heading into this next season, simply because a lot of people don't know a lot about the defense because they saw it underneath the Joe Barry. I think underneath of Halfley, it's going to flip the script. I think it's going to change a lot. Just like, you know, you talk about people talking about the Eagles out there, the Eagles with new, new coach, um, you know, new coordinators, things being changed on the defensive side of the ball. They think that's going to be a boost for the Eagles. I think this coordinator change for Green Bay, bringing Halfley in, getting rid of Barry, I think that's going to be huge for Green Bay. So that is definitely something that I think they will definitely improve on. I will say the defense did struggle at times last season there, maybe even the year before that. I think the defense will be tremendously better this year. Special teams, the last thing they mentioned, special teams was bad for Green Bay last year. Well, yes, that's why we got two kickers in a competition right now, right? That's why we got two kickers in a competition right now is because we're trying to fix that problem with either Joseph or Anders Carlson figuring it out there. So, yes, the defense was not, or the special teams, excuse me there, the special teams was not great last year there. But, I mean, say Anders Carlson loses the job, Greg Joseph steps in, everything's good with the world, changes the whole narrative there. Changes the whole narrative there. Keyshawn Nixon still bringing back kicks. We saw, I mean, he has some explosiveness to him. Now with these new kickoff rules, maybe Green Bay can take advantage of that with Keyshawn Nixon being back there. Also guys like Jaden Reed in the punt game, stuff like that. I think that is going to be a massive boost for him there. Is that change in that kickoff rule? We'll see how that all works out. And how that, I mean, that's going to be something interesting to watch too, is how that affects the special teams on all teams, not just Green Bay but all teams there simply making it easier for, you know, they don't want as many touchbacks. They don't want guys to kneel. They don't want, you know, all that kind of baloney. They want guys to return the football and make it interesting, right? You know, we're going, we're hoping that everybody can be like a Devin Hester out there and we can have at least one kick return for a touchdown every game, right? That's kind of seems what they want is to see more explosiveness in the return game and not make it one of those things where it's just kick it off ends up going through the back of the end zone. They get it out at 25. We move on with life, right? I mean, they, they want to avoid that. That's what they're doing with these new kickoff rules. So I think it's going to change a lot of special teams. Coordinators are going to have a little bit more to plan for essentially. And if you think it's just going to be green Bay who may have troubles in the special teams room, I think you're bogus. I think you're bogus because whoever listening out there, your favorite team might struggle in that same department now is special teams simply because it might be set up better for kick returners, right? It might, it might change the entire landscape. It might change the entire landscape of everything that we know, right? I mean, look at some other things like rule changes that they've made. Baseball is big in, you know, pitch clock and batter clocks and bigger bases and only thrown over the first, you know, how many times rule changes definitely change things, right? They I mean it's self-explanatory there, but they change the pace of things and they change, you know, all that kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's something to keep an eye on there for all teams is how does this new special teams rule affect your team? I think that's something that I'm going to be watching. And I, you know, it has me interested. I sometimes I hate when they make rule changes because it affects. I'm a, I'm a simple person. I'm a simple person. I don't like change. I like to st- I like things to stay as they were. Baseball was a perfect game, an imperfect game, right? It was an imperfect game. Nothing's perfect, right? Nothing's perfect. Nobody is. Nothing is perfect out there. And yet they make these tweaks to it to try to make it better. Now, th- will this tweak make? the special teams, will it make it more interesting? I think it will, right? I think it will. 
Will it make it more interesting for the better or for the worse of the game? That's something we're going to be watching out for. So with that, I mean, that's about all I got for Packer Talk for the day. Just little tidbits here, here and there in that one. But with that, I want to get to some sponsors of our show here quick before we move on. First, game day supply on Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply in Alaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at GameDaySupply.net. Also, Pittsfield Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. Stop in and see the awesome crew at Pittsfield Farm and Home Center in Pittsville, Wisconsin. Marshfield Motor Speedways, located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County Road H. Get down there this summer. Tons of family fun to still be had. Great food, great drinks, great atmosphere. Nothing better than a great summer day or night down at the track there. Marshfield Motor Speedways. Your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy Sewer Anna to find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Sports Scene Sports Cards and Memorabilia, located at the Marshfield Mall in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Get down there and see Al. He has everything you need from sporting cards to memorabilia, jerseys, model stock cards. He's got it all. Sports Scene in Marshfield and Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. If you've been injured recently, whether you were mowing the lawn, you were maybe weed whacking, you were playing with your dogs, playing with your kids, whatever you're doing, you felt something tear, pop, didn't feel right, you went to your doctor, your doctor said you better see a physical therapist. Well, who better to go and see than Chad at Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. He will get you right. He'll get you back mowing the lawn, back weed whacking, back playing with the kids and playing with the dogs, feeling better than ever, feeling better than ever, Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin there. So before we get to the Brewers, before we get to the Brewers, I want to get to a little NBA. And I saw this little graphic I saw today, and I it's, it's going to be a quick one about the NBA. There's a little graphic I saw, and it said, who would you bench? Out of these six guys, you have to make your starting lineup. Who are you going to bench? So the lineup that they showed, the guys that they showed, Shea Gilders, Alexander, Luka Doncic, Giannis, Durant, Embiid, and Jokic. So out of those six, you got your five starters, one guy for the bench. Who are you looking at? Well, you know, this one actually, a lot of people in there were saying like SGA has got to go to the bench, you know. And I was like, SGA to the bench, why? You know, I'm looking at this lineup and I'm like, okay, you put SGA on the bench. You have Doncic, you have Durant, you have Giannis and Bede and Joker in your starting lineup. You have two bigs. Giannis technically qualifies as a big. You have Durant, who is, I mean, a bigger guy, right? And you have Doncic. Who's going to guard any point guard out there in that starting five? I They ain't going to go in the paint, but I'm going to tell you what. Ain't nobody in there going to be able to get close to Steph Curry, right? So looking at these six, I simply, I, it didn't even take me long. SGA is my point guard. I need a little bit of speed. I need some athleticism. That's Shea Gilders Alexander. I need some shooting. Luca. I need a solid shooter behind that in my small forward. Kevin Durant. I need a number four. I need a power forward. Giannis. I need a center. I need a guy who's going to be able to do it all for me and be a bruiser in the paint. Joker. And beads my odd man out. I, I, I Honestly, you look at these five, you look at these six, and you say to yourself, okay, I got to build a lineup out of these six and bench one of them. I don't know how you look at this and you say, I'm going to start both Embiid and Joker. Unless if you're playing a team that on the opposing side has, let's just say, other bigs in the league, uh, Bam out of Bayou starting, and let's just say they also have (sighs) Brooke Lopez, right? Two bigs. I mean, Brooke stands out three-point line, so probably not a good one there. Anthony Davis. Let's go Anthony Davis and Bam out of Bayou. Right, those two guys are the ones that you're squaring off with. Okay, now maybe you can go with two bigs. But yet, I could throw Giannis onto one of them, and I think I could I could make it, right? I think I could figure it out. I just don't, you know, a lot of people saying, 
SGA is on my bench. I think you bench one of the bigs. I think you bench one of the bigs. I don't know. I that was an interesting one. I just thought it was quite interesting. And the comments, I, I saw like fifty of them at least that were looking at putting SGA on the bench and starting Embiid, Joker, Durant, Giannis, and Doncic. I mean, that's a big starting five. That is a big starting five, but also not a lot of speed on there. Not a lot of speed. And I want speed in that point guard position because there's a lot of fast guards. I mean, imagine trying to guard Tyrese Maxey with Luka, right? You have Tyrese and Luka squaring off. Who's going to win that battle? Steph against Luka. Who's going to win that battle, right? I mean, you just look through some of these guys. Who's going to win the battles if you square them off against each other? I think that's that's where SGA steps in. Right, that's where SGA steps in there. So that is about all I had. That's just all I wanted to mention there in that department. But before we move on, I know usually Autumn does the fact of the day here, but I will give you your fact of the day. So, with our fact of the day here, on this day, in 1919, Chicago White Sox outfielder Happy Felch ties the MLB record for four outfield assists in a game in a 15-6 loss to the Boston Red Sox. Definitely did not help the pitching department there. 1932, Brooklyn Dodgers reliever John Quinn, 49, becomes the oldest pitcher to win an MLB game in a 2-1 10th inning victory over the New York Giants at the Polo Grounds there. And also, in 1932, the Summer Olympics Games close in Los Angeles, California. Also in 1933, Jimmy Fox hits for the cycle and sets AL record with nine RBIs in that game. So that was on this day in sports history there. Not a lot happened in the birthday department. I just saw that they had a birthday department here of people born on this day. There probably was somebody important bored on this day i'm just not seeing nothing i'm just not seeing nothing of anything magic johnson there we go magic johnson was born on this day in 1959 so now you know happy birthday to magic johnson out there great stuff great stuff there so with that let's get to some baseball talk for the day let's look at the updated mlb standings right now we're kind of everybody sitting heading into this this week where everybody's sitting, where everybody is kind of trending towards right now. So in the AL, in the AL East, we see the Baltimore Orioles up top there. They are 70 and 50 right now on the season. Tied with them for first place is the New York Yankees, also at 70 and 50. In the record department, six games back right now are the Boston Red Sox, followed by Tampa Bay Rays, who are 10.5 back there, and the Toronto Blue Jays, who are 14.5 back. Looking at the American League Central right now, we see the Guardians with the best record in the American League, and I believe the best record in baseball as it stands right now, 71 and 49 right now. They lead the American League Central by four games over the Minnesota Twins as we head into this week here. Kansas City Royals, they come in in the three spot right now, five and a half back. The Detroit Tigers at 14 back, and well, the Chicago White Sox are mathematically basically eliminated from playoff contention, so who really cares about them? Houston Astros now lead the AL West by a game and a half. Mariners in second there, followed by the Rangers, who are nine and a half back. The Angels, 12 back, and the Oakland Athletics sitting 14 back. In the National League, we see the Phillies up top in the AL East by six and a half over the Braves. The Mets come in at seven and a half games back of first place right now. The Nationals at 14 and a half and the Marlins at 24 and a half. The Brewers lead the Central by eight games right now, followed by the Cardinals. Then the Cincinnati Reds at nine games back, followed by the Cubs at nine and a half games back. And the Pirates, who were surging at one point, have now lost eight in a row. Now they're one and nine in their last 10 games, and they are struggling mightily right now. This is This is the collapse that we talk about with the Pittsburgh Pirates. In the NL West, we see the Dodgers up top, 70-49. and They have the best record in the National League right now, as the Phillies have lost four in a row. The Dodgers have moved into, I believe, yeah, the best record in the National League. Following them up right now, 
is the Arizona Diamondbacks. They're three and a half back. The Padres sitting three and a half back. The Giants at 10 games back. And the Colorado Rockies sitting in last place there. Looking at the wild card race right now in the National League. This is the big one I wanted to look at because the wild card races, it's it's a tight one. It's a tight wild card race right now. In the National League, we see the Diamondbacks and Padres both four games up on the Braves right now in the wild card. The Mets a game back of the wild card. Giants two and a half back. The St. Louis Cardinals three games back. The Cubs sitting and the Cubs four and a half back. The Reds four games back, Pirates six games back. So a tight race there in the National League for that third wild card spot with the Braves looming behind the Padres and the Diamondbacks right now for that one spot. In the American League, I mean, you look Yankees, they're five games up in the wild card, tied for first in the division. The Twins, two and a half games up. Royals in that third wild card spot. One game back are the Red Sox. Mariners are two games back. Five and a half for the Rays, and then it goes down from there, as you know. So we're kind of seeing it all right now. These wild card races are starting to heat up, and it's only going to get crazier, right? It's only going to get crazier as we go along here. So with that, I want to get some Brewer talk here. I want to get some Brewer talk. Um, The first thing I want to say about the Brewers is I don't know what it is about watching the Brewers and Dodgers series when the Brewers play the Dodgers. I don't know what it is about this series when they play each other, but everything is just amplified for me, I guess is what I want to say. You know, I watch the Brewers and they could be playing, let's just say the the Phillies or the Cubs and the Cardinals, right? I, I don't like, I don't like the Cubs. I don't like the Cardinals. The Phillies are eh, for me there, but <clears throat> excuse me there. But you know, you look at these teams, and it's like, ah, you know, I really don't care that much. They play the Dodgers, and it's just like every bad thing that every bad thing that could possibly happen to the Brewers happens. It just seems to happen. Like I just watched Garrett Mitchell swinging a ninety-five mile per hour fastball dead red and swing right through it. Like everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong when the Brewers play the Dodgers. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and you know. Colin Ray can look fantastic against the Phillies. He can go pitch against the Dodgers, same style, same everything, and the Dodgers are going to light him up for how many runs. It, it's just, I don't know what it is, but the Dodgers just have the Brewers number. They just have it. It's been like this for years. They just have their number, and it's just a downhill slope. It, it just seems like the Brewers cannot get over the hump of the Dodgers. 2018 was the last time where I thought the Brewers were going to get over that hump, and they failed to get over that hump. Right now, I mean, like I said, we're talking about a 7-1 to game right now. Looking at the Brewers, I mean, bottom of the seventh, potentially, probably, most likely, barring a massive comeback, which I'm hoping for, right? But it seems like it's out the door. Leaving guys on base is a problem. And these Brewers hitters, you know, they it's like we go into a Dodgers series, and these Brewers hitters, we could go up against the Braves, and these Brewers hitters could drop 30 runs. You know, we saw them do ridiculous things against the Braves this last time out. They could do ridiculous things against the Braves. And then they go face this Dodgers team who doesn't have – there. there isn't a guy in the Brewers or in the Dodgers rotation or anything like that that has this phenomenal ERA. They're not the greatest pitching team in the world, right? But it's just like the Brewers face them, and it happens against a lot of not-so-great pitchers. The Brewers face them, and it's like – This guy looks like he could win a Cy Young when he faces the Brewers. Why is that? It's just the Dodgers to me. It's just the Dodgers to me. They face this team, and it's like they show up, and they're already overmatched somehow. I I don't understand how they're overmatched in the series, but it just seems like they show up and they're overmatched. They don't know what to do. They they're guessing on pitches. They don't. It's like it's like it's their first time picking up a baseball bat. They have no idea what to do. You know, I don't know what it is. (laughs) Like Gavin Stone. I thought Gavin Stone for the Dodgers pitched a good game, but he left a lot over the plate. He left a lot over the plate that the Brewers missed. Same with Clayton Kershaw. I thought Clayton Kershaw pitched a good game, but Kershaw left some over the plate for the Brewers. These younger guys for the Brewers seem like they were looking at, I I don't know, like looking at them and the feeling that I got when watching the Brewers hitters was like they were facing like, primetime Mariano Rivera coming out of the back end of the bullpen, and you had to try to muster across two runs. That's what it seemed like when they were facing. It seems like that's what it's like when they're facing the Dodgers, right? Bryce Terang right now, he starts in an 0-2 hole. I mean, I thought uh, Jeff Levering was the one talking about last night, but he said it. I mean, 
straight as an arrow right now. Bryce Terang, he steps up to the plate. It's like this guy's in an 0-2 hole. A lot of these Brewers hitters against the Dodgers, it seems like they're stepping up there in an 0-2 hole already, and they can't figure it out. They're watching a lot of pitches right over the plate, and then they're chasing some bad pitches along with it. It's a guessing game right now. It's a, And I'm not taking away from what Gavin Stone did or what Kershaw did because I thought they pitched good games. I thought they did. I did not think they pitched. I just watched Joey Ortiz watch when 96 right down the middle. I mean, that's what I'm talking about is the Brewers are going up to the plate, and they're digging themselves these holes because they're guessing. Second and third, two outs. I can only imagine what's going to happen next. I, I can't believe that they just – I'm just going to eat my own words on that one, that Joey Ortiz just dribbled one down the third baseline, and that was a fiasco. They ended up scoring a run. I guess I'll take it out as I, I can take it as I get it, right? I can take it as I get it. But not, not – I mean, nine times out of ten, probably not going to work out in the Brewers' favor. I mean, it's the guys left on base. It's the clutch, uh, clutch moments in these games – the Brewers, you know, I talked about it yesterday. Are they even with the Dodgers right now? No. I don't think they are. I don't think they are because I think it's a mentality thing with the Brewers. I really do. I think it's the mentality of the Brewers. Early on this season, I made a comment that I never felt like the Brewers were out of games. I never felt like they did. You know, it didn't matter who it was. If it was the Phillies, it didn't matter to me who it was. I never felt like the Brewers were out of a game. Right now, facing this Dodgers team, it feels like when the Dodgers went up four to one, I believe it was at one point. It was four to one after that two run shot. When they went down four to one, it felt like they this game might be out of reach. This game might be out of reach for the Brewers. Like it, ju- it just has that feeling when they face the Dodgers. Is like the mistakes can't happen. And right now, you know, I talked to Freddie Peralta yesterday. There, can Freddie Peralta be the ace of the Brewers staff? I don't think so. I'll be honest with you, I don't think so. Simply because Freddie Peralta, as I mentioned yesterday, gets himself into problems or gets himself into trouble, but also look at the pitches that he leaves over the plate. And that's the same with Colin Ray. The one to Will Smith was the one that was inner half, but it was middle of the zone, right? But the Shohei Otani home run, that was a middle, middle sinker. Middle, middle sinker. What's Shohei Otani going to do with that besides put it in the parking lot, right? What's he going to do with it? The pitches, I, I don't know if it's Contreras' game calling, if it's just pitchers missing spots that bad, but the way that they pitch is like even they're breaking stuff. Why are we starting it middle of the plate or high and breaking it down? You know, I watched Bryce Terang take strike three. I mean, why are these Brewers pitchers, and this I guess is my biggest concern, is that the breaking stuff. You know, I I, I don't know. I, I pitched a little bit, right? I pitched high school, pitched college a little bit. Why do Brewers pitchers, Freddie Peralta's big for this, start that breaking ball so they wanted to break into the zone, right? You can get away with it every once in a while. But when that breaking ball, say it's that curveball, breaks in. Look, at that's what I'm talking with that Kershaw start. He was throwing a good curveball, but he was leaving it up in the zone. Same with Freddie. He throws a good breaking ball. It has the bite. It has the break, but he's leaving it up in the zone. You watch some of the better, the better relievers, better starters in the game. Where is the breaking stuff? It breaks down. It breaks down near, you know, bottom of the zone to just outside of the zone on the bottom there, making guys chase that pitch. Look at what Gavin Stone did to the Brewers last night with his changeup, right? That changeup was not in the zone. He made the Brewers hitters look like doorknobs out there when they were swinging. Yes, were they guessing? 100%. But he was making them look foolish when they were swinging because he was breaking it out of the zone. Colin Ray. Didn't do that in his start. Four home runs. Freddie Peralta did not do that in his start. Gave up a couple home runs. It's the little things like that that kills the starting pitchers for the Brewers. Why their home run numbers are near the top in the the league right now, that has a big reason to do with it, right? And, I mean, looking at the Brewers' bats right now, 
why they're struggling. If they face their own pitchers, they'd probably be phenomenal because guys leave it up. Well, I don't even know. I don't even know because looking at Kershaw, he was leaving a lot up too. And the Brewers hitters seem fooled by everything. It's the Dodgers. It just it, it just feels like as the Dodgers that when the Brewers face them, all bets are off. And they could go into this thing on a torrid pace and everything just seems to fall apart. Everything just seems to fall, fall apart for the Brewers all at once. They can't pitch. They can't hit. Everything starts to go out the window. So back to my question from yesterday, do I think the Brewers are up to par with the Dodgers? No, I don't think they are. I think they have the potential to be. I think this lineup has potential. I, th- I think they have a boatload of potential. Do I think they have the star power? No. But do I think they have the ability to bang it out with the Dodgers? Yes, I do. I really do. I really do think the Brewers' bats have what it takes to get in a series with the Dodgers and potentially be able to find to go run for run with them at times. The Dodgers find a ways in the power game. Brewers' starting pitchers, relievers need to find a way to limit that, to limit the home run ball. Keep Shohei Otani in the park. Keep Mookie Betts in the park. Keep these guys in the ballpark. Make them work for runs. They find ways to manufacture runs. I'm not going to say they can't manufacture runs other ways, but the home run ball is what kills the Brewers, and it's killing them mightily in this series against the Dodgers right now. I'm looking at this 7-2 to here in the top of the eighth. I'm hoping, like I said, Brewers come back, and I'm wrong, but right now, looking at it as I'm talking right now, it looks like the Brewers are going to start this series in a 2 nothing hole in a series that they wanted to prove that they could be a top team in the NL, and they wanted to try and play and play – they wanted to play their way to a two seed, right? They wanted to play their way to a two seed. And right now they're playing like possibly a wild card team. They're playing like a wild card team right now who barely has the business to be in this. Now, game three, four, that could change the entire perspective. You split this series with the Dodgers before you have the Guardians. That could set you up for a world of just feeling better about yourself. But it's getting that one, getting the lead and holding on to that lead that the Brewers are struggling right now because they're starting in holes against this Dodger team early. And the Dodgers, when they've they found gaps, they pour on runs. They find that gap and they pour on runs, and that's what they've been doing right now to this Brewers team. So watching the Brewers and Dodgers just irritates me. It irritates the – you know, if you're a fan of baseball – you know, you're probably saying to yourself, well, the Brewers are stinking. The Brewers are stinking. If you're a Brewer fan, you're saying, why does it always the Dodgers who just have our number? It just does not make sense there. So with that, that's about all I got. That's about all I got for today. I mean, not a whole lot happening in the world of Wisconsin sports, but I mean, we're getting closer and closer to the fall. We're going to have a lot of Packer talk going on, a lot of Badger football talk, getting closer and closer to Badger basketball. So we're going to be talking Badger. I mean, it's going to heat up fast. It's going to heat up fast. Plus baseball. We have baseball postseason not too far out. And I can't wait to be talking about the Brewers in the postseason, hopefully for a long stretch there. So with that, like I always say, if you can like follow, Anywhere on social media, follow us, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Find us out there. Follow us there. Otherwise, like, leave a review on our, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening, make sure you like, subscribe, uh, leave a review. Definitely, if you have the opportunity, share the show out there to your friends, family, whoever you know. Share it out there for us. Help us grow. That would be awesome there. But with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, deuces. Yeah, oh my Lord, watch me sway. Darkness falls and we all pray. Hoping for the light of day Down to the river I have held the devil's hand Felt the weight of my own sin Burdened by the heart of man Down to the river Down to the river